guys so moving with something. These yeah. are the guys that run the show. This is Kyle, okay. our editor in chief. Okay. How's it going? This is creative director Ethan Nicole. Okay. So I mean, uh, well, I guess before we get started, like uh, maybe you guys could tell me like what's the, you know, how, how did the V get started and yeah, sure. and and uh, yeah. What's your deal? And why, do, why are you in California? Oh, we're getting interviewed. Yeah. We're getting interviewed. That's, way, that's way easier, actually. I'm much better at being interviewed, so no problem. Yeah, the, the BU is just this little like Christian humor site that we launched in 2016. And it was just like, we spent 50 bucks on the domain name, started writing jokes, throwing them out there. And uh, it started to go big in conservative circles a couple years ago. And, uh, and that's just kind of where we got uh, to where we are. Seth is our CEO. He bought the site a few years ago from okay. the original founder. Yeah. Who was the original founder? Uh, his name is Adam Ford. He's in love with the company anymore. Uh, he owns, he owns a piece, piece of it. Yeah. He does not the B now. You, you, if oh, you've seen that, the, you know, the, yeah. But they were just unaffiliated? No, they're, no, they're, they're kind of affiliated, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're kind of you affiliated. retweet them? Yeah. 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 Okay. So they do like real news, but crazy real news. <laughs> real news. It's like the backup plan. It's like when satire is impossible because the world's too absurd, then we just report on the absurdity over on not the B. I see. So, you know, plan B. Yeah. 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 Real, reality is weird, weirder than fiction. Yeah, exactly. Um, often is. So how many people are at the B now? Yeah, we've got uh, probably a dozen full timers now. It's grown pretty fast. A year ago, it was, it was three of us. Okay. We have over, we have like twenty five people involved, like just not all full time yeah. staff. So many, you'd be surprised. Like with satire, you don't have to have a writing staff, uh, like filling a room, churning out articles all day long. You can only handle so much satire every day. You know, like we're not, right. we don't need to publish an article every three minutes, like Fox yeah. News or Daily Wire or something like that. So um, we have a lot of part time. One of our writers here, Frank Fleming, is one of our writers, okay. um, and he's he's got a full time job. He just writes for us on the side. Okay, yeah. we'd love to have him full time. Yeah. I'm the local guy. <laughs> Yeah, he lives in Austin. Oh, you live in Austin, okay. Texas yeah. over California. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm a Florida guy. I have my head, the headquarters are technically in South Florida. I'm in, in oh, Southeast okay. Florida. Yeah. And, uh, Florida man. I'd love to get these guys <laughs> to Florida, but it's hard to get people out of California. It really is. It's, uh, yeah. it's more challenging I mean, than you think. Despite uh, the California, the state of California doing everything it can to encourage people to leave. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think you had one article about how... Uh, Gavin Newsom is a U-Haul salesman of the year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually true. <laughs> Actually true. <laughs> so you don't uh, miss it then? Uh, no, the, I mean, there's certainly many aspects of California that I do like. Um, most of my friends are still in California. So some of my best friends are California. So yeah, uh, I, I, do, I do miss many aspects of California, especially my friends. Uh, and it's beautiful and lots of cool things, mm -hmm. uh, but increasingly difficult to get things done. Um, and uh, California used to be the land of opportunity, and now it is the has become and it's becoming more so the land of um, uh, sort of over regulation, over litigation, uh, over taxation, poop on the sidewalk, <laughs> and and scorn. <laughs> it's just so it's, it's like it's not like thanks for the taxes. It's like thanks for the taxes and Hacksaw. kick you in the teeth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> exactly. You didn't exactly get a thank you note. Yeah. <laughs> so the B, okay, let me flip the question though. So that's kind of the story of the B. The B started out as, you know, this little blog. It took off. It's kind of blown up into something. Like now we have a following, including you. Like how, how do we get on your radar? People sharing our articles and you just saw them coming across your feed? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I saw you on Twitter at, at one point. The, 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 I, th I thought some of the articles were quite, quite funny. Um, I wrote those. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I used to be a much bigger fan of the uh, of the Onion, uh, but then the, the, the Onion just seems to have gotten um, really politi politically correct. Um, you know, it's sort of gone a bit, but in the SNL direction, it's more leftist. As you know, it's it's basically it, it will it will not really make fun of anything on the left. And it, but it, and it used to be much more even-handed than The Onion. Um, and, um, and then they just, they just got uh, the woke mind virus. Yeah. So uh, to the point where The Onion just was, it used to be very funny, and, and then it was not that funny. You know, SNL, I, I used to be a huge fan of SNL, but you know, I still think they have some, some occasional good stuff, but it's just become, uh, I think you've written some, some articles about this, um, you know, SNL, had, many, 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 if not most of the uh, SNL episodes are kind of a, a moral lecture on why we're bad human beings right. uh, instead of comedy. Yeah. So, and, and again, uh, won't make fun of anything on the left, really. Like, 
you know, they'll beat up on Ted Cruz 17,000 times. Right. right. <laughs> You're like, okay, we get it. You know? And often but because like, he's made fun of someone on the left, he'll make fun of someone on the left and then yeah. they jump on him for that. It's like a defensive thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's, yeah. it's just, um, there are just a lot of no-fly zones uh, with a lot of comedy. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then you realize that's like, wait a second, is, 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 the comedy, is, is the comedy getting in a, at an essential truth or, or trying to, or is there, is there a propaganda element or, or is, is it trying to push you in a particular direction or, or, or getting, getting to an essential truth that is humorous? Mm -hmm. and, and when it stops trying to get to an essential truth that, that, is, that is humorous, then, you, you know, it's, it's just not that funny. Right. Um, now, see, that's exactly the criticism we get from the left. The criticism from the left is that that's what we're doing with our humor, is that we're trying to push a narrative, mm -hmm. neglecting the truth. Well, it's literally it's like, what the New York Times says, was right. that we are far-right misinformation disguised as satire. Right, right. You know? So there's a... <laughs> it's I almost where you're standing. jealousy to it. Yeah, it's almost based yeah, on where you're standing, to, how you see it. It's based on where you're standing. Yeah. I, I mean, I'd say the B is probably is moderately right. Um, it's, not, it's not, but it's not, certainly not far-right. My, my impression is not that... Uh, I would say that the B is not probably, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be accurate to say the B is fully centrist. <laughs> um, but but it, is, it is certainly not far right. Um, if, if one is fully left and 10 is fully right, the B seems to be at 6, 6.5. Uh, towards okay. the right. It, it, that ish. But so Bernie but, Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Babylon B, Hitler. <laughs> or somewhere <laughs> on that scale. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not, but you know, it's a. It's a but, I mean, uh, the, 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 B, the B is, I, th I think, less right than, than, say, the onion is, is left, for example. Oh, okay. you know? So the, the, the onion, I think, would be more left than the, the B is right. R right, rightist, or whatever. Yeah, rightist. <laughs> we'll have to put that on our Wikipedia uh, page. Rightist, <laughs> leftist. rightist propaganda. <laughs> you, know, you talked about the woke mind virus, and I was wondering if you could decipher this tweet of yours for me, because I'm not a programmer. You wrote... Trace route woke underscore mind underscore virus. What does that mean? Um, okay, so trace route is um, a networking uh, command to. Uh, so if you, if you want to figure out a path to a particular server or, or domain, uh, you'd say trace route or in Windows trace RT. Uh, that would show you the path to a particular uh, source server. Um, either an IP address or domain name, and, and it, it would show you all, basically all the hops that, that it goes through um, and the, the, uh, the latency between each, each hop. And so... I know some of those words. <laughs> yeah. Um, so trace route would be, yeah, it would be like, where did it come from? Yeah. Where did the virus come from? What is its origin? So did this work? Did this command work? Yeah, or no? Did you find you figure read it the comments. out? <laughs> read the, the comments, comments and, see, and see. All right. it, it is a prevalent mind virus and um, arguably one of the biggest threats to modern civilization. Also, not having enough kids, right? Uh, yeah, I think um, most people, if, if you just simply look at the birth rate statistics, um, you can tell what the future is going to be like because you can see how many children were born last year. Um, and, uh, and then you can say, like, is, this, is the birth rate trending down or up? Uh, and it's been trending down basically almost everywhere. So, so you, you, if you look at the birth rate last year, you know, you know how many adults there will be in 20 years because that's how many babies were born. The, the, the trend is, like, like you don't have to be some master of statistician or something like that. Um, you can just look, look at kids born last year, trending to well below replacement rate. Uh, and, and a lot of countries have been well below replacement rate for a long time. Well, the concern um, is that if you have kids then they'll contribute to climate change and then they'll kill the earth. Right? That's the leftist concern is that we're overpopulating the Earth and that we're going to kill it. Are you trying to overpopulate the Earth so that we can go to Mars and take over, and take over Mars? <laughs> the, earth is, is, the Earth is far from <laughs> is overpopulated. Is this a deliberate strategy? <laughs> the, the Earth is far from overpopulated. Um, uh, far, far from overpopulated. Um, so the, you know, the, the, the thing that's necessary to minimize the chemical change to the atmosphere and oceans is to move to sustainable energy generation and consumption. So the, the three elements of a sustainable energy future are uh, sustainable energy generation, primarily through solar, wind, some geothermal, uh, hydro, and um, nuclear. Um, although they're shutting down all the nuclear power stations, so yeah. 
You can sort of cross that one with the list, which they shouldn't be doing. They should just keep, they should keep moving. Um, they're, they're, they're really, unless a nuclear power plant is in a region of uh, major natural disasters. Yeah, like instability or something, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to be like, you know, subject to massive um, natural disasters because obviously that could be a problem. But if you're, you know, like say Germany or France or whatever, they don't have those, so the, the, the nuclear power is very safe. Um, but anyway, the, the, the long term, um, the, the heavy lifting on uh, energy generation will be solar uh, followed by wind. And, um, and you really don't need a, a very large land area to generate enough power to uh, power, for example, the United States. So it's on, on the order of you know, roughly a little over 100 miles by 100 miles a section of land with solar, solar panels would power the entire United States. So like a little corner of Utah or Texas, it's like mm. um, it can power the whole country. So anyway, so uh, it's really not that hard. The solar incidence is a gigawatt per square kilometer. Uh, if, for most nuclear- I'm just gonna do some calculations. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> most nuclear power plants- if, Yeah, that's right. Most nuclear, most, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a kilowatt per square, per square, ki, per square meter and, and there's a million square, you know, million square meters in a, in, in a square kilometer. So, um, it's a pretty simple uh, math. So uh, and then you'll get, you get like maybe 20% efficiency on that. So call it like net power generation of uh, 200 megawatts per square kilometer. Now, if, if you take most nuclear power plants, uh, there's usually a, lo uh, a pretty big, uh, clear area around a nuclear power plant because people don't usually want to live right next to a nuclear power plant. So um, the area of most nuclear power plants that is uninhabited, uh, if, if, um, if covered in solar panels, would generate more power than the nuclear power plant. Um, and then you also, the, then the, the second element that's needed are batteries to store uh, solar and wind uh, because uh, it, the sun doesn't shine all the time and the wind doesn't blow all the time. So the, inter, the intermittency of uh, solar and wind requires battery storage for continuous power. Uh, so that's the second part of the, of the, of the sort of second, the second pillar of sustainable energy. And the third is uh, sustainable transport. Uh, so that means uh, electric uh, cars, boats, planes, and then ironically, the one thing that you can't really make electric is rockets. And I was saying involved in that. But, but although you can, over time, uh, use solar power to generate uh, fuel by pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, combining it with H2O, creating CH4, which is methane, and O2, oxygen. And rock, rockets are mostly oxygen by mass. So uh, over time, you can make everything basically solar power. So you're working on some of those problems, but the problem of wokeness specifically, you mentioned that's like a mind virus and it's destructive. Uh, and why, why do you think wokeness is so destructive? I'm interested in your, your opinions too. Um, but, you know, like, I mean, generally, I think we should be aiming for like a, a positive society and, uh, you know, that this, it should be okay to you know, be humorous, uh, like, you know, like we should, we should, like, like wokeness basically wants to make comedy illegal, <laughs> which is not cool. We've experienced a bit of that. <laughs> I mean, Ch Chappelle, like what the? Flower bed. I mean, try to shut down Chappelle, come on, man, that's crazy. Um, so, um, you know, so do, do we want a humorless society that is, is simply rife with condemnation, uh, and hate, basically. Uh, and no forgiveness, right? Yeah. yeah. The, at, at its heart, w wokeness is divisive, um, exclusionary, um, and hateful. It's, it's, it basically gives mean people a reason, a, 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 it, it gives them a shield to be, to be mean and cruel, mm. armored in false virtue. What do you think? I'd agree with that. Yeah, yeah I mean, we've, we've obviously seen that from the left, you know, just ourselves. You know, the left is almost this religion now where they're so serious and they believe what they believe with such intensity that for us to make fun of them, you know, for them it's like you're making fun of God or salvation, you know. So they're almost the new religious right in our view. Yeah. yeah. He agreed with me. <laughs> I'm going to take note. <laughs> Well, you were pretty mean to uh, Senator Warren, though, on Twitter recently. You slammed her, man. Uh, please don't call the manager on me, Senator Karen. <laughs> she struck first, yeah. obviously. Right. Yes, she did. She called me a freeloader yeah. um, and a grifter who doesn't pay taxes, basically. 
um, and I'm literally paying the most tax that any individual in history has ever paid this year, <laughs> ever. Uh, and she doesn't pay taxes, <laughs> at, basically at all. And her, tax, and her salary is paid for by the taxpayer, like me. Could you even use, <laughs> could you know, you use like, TurboTax? Irony? Would that even work? If, 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 if you could die by irony, <laughs> she, would be, she would be dead. <laughs> if irony could kill. <laughs> what would happen if you walked into an H&R block to file your taxes? Like, could they handle your case? My taxes are actually not that complicated. Um, I do not have any offshore accounts. Uh, I don't have any uh, sort of tax shelters. Uh, uh, I, I, have a, I have basically a Tesla and SpaceX stock. Um, and... Um, Tesla is publicly traded, so all information is public. And SpaceX is, you know, a, a C corp that is audited, uh, you know, that has outside auditors. So it, it, these it's it, with uh, outside investors. So it, it is. They're also. It's everything is extremely transparent. Mm -hmm. um, there are there is no uh, there there are no elaborate sort of tax avoidance schemes or, or anything like that. So H&R so Block could could easily do my taxes. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't need H&R Block. Uh, I could do it. Yeah. You know, it, like, I'd probably take me a few hours to do my taxes. It's very basic. Did you sell that stock like, in Tesla because of the Twitter poll? Uh, in part. Had you made up your mind that you were already going to do that before the Twitter poll? Um, there, there, uh, I, I have some Tesla options that are expiring next year. Uh, that, so I needed to uh, exercise those options uh, no matter what. Uh, and, and I was like, okay, I'll, I'll move forward and exercise those options. Um, so that, that, that certainly would be part of it, uh, no matter what. Uh, but then over and above that, I sold incremental stock uh, to uh, try to get up to the 10% level. So just the option exercise alone would not get to 10%. Mm. So uh, I sold uh, stock that should be roughly make my total uh, Tesla share sale roughly 10%. Is the most annoying thing in the world people asking you questions like this about your personal finances? <laughs> hey, no one ever asked me what stock I'm selling or, or why I made so much money last year. I mean, I'm the third richest man on my street, which is, which is pretty good. Pretty good. I mean, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's all that productive or interesting. You know, essentially all of my net worth is, uh, is just in SpaceX and Tesla stock. These two companies that, that I helped create uh, and, and have run uh, for now almost 20 years, um, have done a lot of useful things. Um, SpaceX is the launches more payload to orbit than the rest of the world combined, um, and has a, a global internet system called Starlink, and and is the primary provide well the the only U.S. provider of uh, astronaut transport to the, the space station. Um, we publish six to eight satire articles a day. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are funny. So that's, so, uh, I mean, pretty good. So, so, so SpaceX, uh, yeah, it transports U.S. Um, and uh, as well as non-U.S. Uh, astronauts to the space station um, that was previously the U.S. was dependent on on Russia, uh, who was doing a good job, but charging kind of crazy money per seat. Mm. So, as for, with with SpaceX, the the, the cost per Astronaut dropped uh, dramatically, and and the money was you know went to jobs in the U.S. So th th that's what why why people you know think SpaceX is valuable. Uh, Tesla. Uh, is I mean the annoyance though of like people uh, holding it against you that you've had success, holding it against you that you have wealth. Um, you know, viewing billionaires as evil and. You know, you're not doing enough to give back. You know, you have like the Elizabeth Warren thing that you haven't paid your fair share. I mean, that's, you know, it's, that's got to be kind of aggravating. Yeah, I think it's just important to understand, like, w like what is this wealth? Uh, it's not like some, it's not like I've got like some, some massive, massive cash balance. Uh, I've, my cash balances are, are very, very low. Um, and at least until I sold stock, uh, which is really the first time I've actually sold stock uh, in any meaningful way, uh, was this quarter? Um, I I simply had loans against my my stock. So I I, I if, if Tesla and SpaceX went bankrupt, I would go bankrupt too immediately. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not it's, realized, it's, is what you're saying. Yeah, it's not. No, it, yeah. it's just like people. It's just like it's like um, you know I built these two companies. 
and it was extremely difficult to build them. Um, like massively painful and difficult. Um, rewarding too, but also but, but massively painful and difficult. Um, and, uh, and, and I didn't, I didn't sell the stock in the companies. Um, you know, I, I, you know, my, my sort of impression was that, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't take money off the table or you shouldn't, you shouldn't take stock off the table and de-risk things that a captain should go down, you know, with their ship. So, so it's like, okay, like, I, you know, I don't want to take money off the table. And then, then if the companies fail, then I will be, I'll be sort of enriched while investors suffer. And that did not seem right. So anyway, so I, that, that's the reason I didn't sell is, is I could easily have diversified and, and protected myself financially if, if SpaceX or Tesla went bankrupt, but I, I did not. Um, and SpaceX and Tesla came very close to bankruptcy many times. Even when bankruptcy was literally weeks away, I did not sell stock. Uh, and, and then the companies became valuable. Not, Tesla's value is, and SpaceX's value is not, it's not up to me, it's up to investors. Um, and they decided it was worth, Tesla was worth a trillion dollars in the public market. So, and I own 20% of the company, so. So you're not apologizing right now? You're not gonna look into the camera and say, I'm so sorry. Look in the camera right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to explain, like, I don't think people necessarily understand. They don't, yeah, um, yeah. That, uh, that this this is not you know the, the, some function of, of sort of hoarding or something. It's it's simply that you know I own twenty percent of the company that became very valuable as decided by external investors, and so twenty percent of a trillion dollar valuation is two hundred billion dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've you know I've said at various times that I think the stock price is too high, um, but the, the investors just ignored that. I'm like, okay, I literally said it's too high. Um, and uh, they just kept making that price higher. So I'm like, tell them our value is too high. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so it's just that's. Uh, but like I said, this is not like uh, my so-called wealth is it, it, not some. It's, it's not some deep mystery. It's simply what is my ownership percentage of SpaceX and Tesla? Multiply that by the valuation. That's my net worth. It's mm -hmm. super simple, and my taxes are super simple. And I have no, like I said, no offshore accounts, no sort of uh, clever tax evasion or anything like that. And I don't I don't draw a salary or any cash salary or bonus from the companies at all. So um, again, I thought that was like morally good to, to not do that. Um, uh, and so there were there were like there was one year I think 2018 where where I I didn't pay any tax, uh, but but that's because I didn't have any income. Um, and 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 but I did have a little bit of income, but I had actually overpaid taxes I think in 2017. So I paid too much tax, and so I got like. I basically netted that out in, in 2018 because I paid too much tax in 2017, right. <laughs> accidentally. Um, unless you sell stock, there are no realized gains. So, uh, so then I was like, well, should I sell? Like, I, I, like, what am I supposed to do? Why send shares to the government somehow? I don't know if you can even do that. Yeah. Um, so then I was like, well, like, unless I sell shares, uh, there's, not, there's, no, there's no actual mechanism to pay tax. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, well, should I sell 10%, you know, to, in order to pay tax? Uh, and, and I sort of asked Twitter, and they're like, on balance, they said yes. And so I, um, so I, I sold enough stock to get to around 10% plus the option exercise stuff. And uh, I, very, I try to be extremely literal. Um, so that you don't generally need to read between the lines. You can just read the lines. Mm -hmm. So that's it. As the uh, as the fattest guy here, I, I want to know what's when are you gonna make the candy company? You said on Twitter that you're making a candy company, <sighs> and you're the closest thing to Willy Wonka that this culture yeah, has. Yeah, it could be Willy Wonka. I didn't say it. When did he say that? He said, That's "I'm starting recent? a candy well, company. It's going to I was be making fun of Warren Buffett." <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Um, but you did say I am super, super serious. That's, that's super, super. <laughs> We've got I think, I think if, you, if you put two supers before serious, <laughs> that makes then, it then that's serious. like you're probably not serious. <laughs> you know? uh, just uh, yes. FI for satire writers out there. Yeah. Um, I thought that locked it in as like <laughs> definitely serious. Yeah. He's explaining jokes to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's just, uh, guy said, let me tell you how jokes and satire works. Um, no, I was, I was just obviously, I was just like making fun of Warren Buffett who's like really, he's got this like candy company and stuff. So, um, and um, 
That was my one question. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what you got. <laughs> you can go. Now, now I, I, I did actually, uh, it, I did actually experiment with um, trying to find some compelling candy that would be like, I don't know, maybe much better than other candy. Um, we, we tried various candy options, but I, I didn't find any. I couldn't figure out a candy that was like just way better than other candy. Um, like a little bit better, but not a lot better. And so it was like, uh, unless it's like really a, a great product, then you looked the, into this. You like so you really looked into it. Yeah, yeah. Did. Like a lab. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, we tr tried a whole bunch of different candies, <laughs> wow. and uh, and it was like, hmm, there's not anything like that's obviously just way better. Uh, so um, I don't want to just have like a pretty good candy. If there's like <laughs> a great candy, yeah, yeah some candy. aces, some candy that's aces. Um, but we, you know, we don't need another sort of like pretty good candy. You know? Yeah, mm. there's plenty of those out yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. What does that look like when you like suddenly get an idea like we should make candy? You like you just call somebody and like how does what what are the steps that suddenly take place when you're like because you do so many things? I'm just fascinated by the what that process looks yeah. like. Rockets, tunnels. You got a guy you call, Jim. I want to make candy. <laughs> make it happen. Like, um, I think I, I did ask for. You know, uh, people on Twitter to send me candy um, <laughs> that they thought was good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was like, well, what if some of this candy is like, you know, it's poisonous or something, but whatever. Like, you know, candy from strangers on the internet. Yeah. It, 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 it could go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not 100% safe. Um, but uh, I did try a whole bunch of candy sent from strangers. <laughs> what, what's your favorite candy? Sorry, well, there was like a, a pretty good like peanut, there were like some pretty good peanut brittle ones, or like that peanut brittle with a bunch of other stuff in it, mm -hmm. and uh, so, some pretty good chocolates, but but nothing that was like blew me away. So, um, and and then there were people at SpaceX and Tesla that that sent me some candy options, but no, no, nothing that was. It's not like I care about starting companies. Like if there's like there are if there's a comp a very compelling product or service, then that's the thing that is important, not the company. You know, a company is just an assemblage of people to create uh, a compelling product or service. And if a company does not provide great products and services, it should not exist. There's no point in a company f for the sake of being a company that's pointless. The companies should only exist to provide great products and services. A company is just, just literally a group of people so do we have to close to down, or <laughs> can we stay open? Yeah, wait, I, I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of companies out there that probably should just be disbanded yeah. um, because they, they don't make uh, compelling products and services. It's pointless. And those people, better that those people do something else. I think on that topic, I mean, the, the question that I just like really, I mean, I feel so unqualified to be interviewing you right now. I think we all do. Why are we here? Like, what, what drew know, you, you to like, you, actually you, sit you down with us? Yeah. I'm not, the one, asked asked the, I'm not yes. the one who asked for the podcast. You guys did. Just to be clear. We were, we I'm not pushing the yes. podcast on you. <laughs> you guys came here. We, just, um, we were like, I will stop by, you know, Texas. Yeah, just to be clear who was just asking who. You know, like, you know. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not like, you know, I know, I know didn't exactly podcast. hold a gun to your head for this podcast. Okay. I'm trying to be asking him right now. You could be on CNN right now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> John Lennon can A real be. news organization. Yeah. yeah. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah. I don't know. No, I, uh, unfortunately, I just, you know, haven't, um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, what, what was it you said? The, the requirement for being a CNN, a job at CNN is... Uh, yeah. are, you, are you a pervert? Uh, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm not perverted enough, yeah. uh, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Not a big uh, pedophile fan? <laughs> You know Babylon B headlines better than I do. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, a lot of us fantasize about if we had lots and lots and lots of money, what we do. And you've done a lot of the things that, like, a lot of us fantasize about. Build cool robots, going to go to Mars, we're going to fix traffic. But most of us also think we'd become Batman. Have you ever thought about, like, what would that really look like to become? Or would you go Batman or Iron Man route? What kind of, crime what kind is of on the bat? Rise. A fruit bat or an insect bat? I like the dragon bat. Or, it's big, <laughs> scary. You know, because most bats are either fruit or They carry a lot of diseases. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they eat fruit and bugs, like yeah. fruit batman, insect batman. <laughs> fruit uh, batman. Um, I need to read yeah. that spin-off comic now. 
<laughs> it's a strange choice of uh, creature to emulate, you know. Um, yeah, that's true. You pick a different animal, like uh, maybe monkeys um, that play pong with their brains. Man. Man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what would pong be? Monkey man. Monkey man, yeah, exactly. <laughs> just very agile. They're the smartest animal, right? You can just uh, swing. Mo monkey man. That Batman is more is more like Monkey Man, really. You True. Because he's swinging just, like around. Yeah. he's swinging around and very agile, um, climbing up things and. Yeah, throwing so, a batarang is more like I mean, throwing. For, for, for Batman, like why can't he fly if he's Batman? Right. Bats can fly. Yeah, that's you know? true. He just yeah, he glides. He glides yeah. very effectively though. Yeah. So he's really yeah, but that's like a yeah. Frank. Squ it's more like <laughs> flying squirrel man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Squirrel Man. <laughs> but it says less, it's less intimidating, I guess. Yeah. Oh no, Squirrel Man. We're, we're, we're he's, he's gonna get us. You know. Um, not Squirrel Man again. Yeah. Have you ever thought of making the, the grappling hook he has? That thing's sweet. We need those. You can make probably make that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, you can make a grappling hook. Um, I, I mean, the thing is, like, like, like when you. It's, it's, it's like they, they sort of skip the parts where like Batman's always on the top of a building, but like once you get to the ground floor, how do you get back to the top of the building? Yeah, it's like you it's like, go you're up. kind of huffing and puffing, you know. Yeah, climb. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, you never seen. I mean, how do you get the, the top of a skyscraper? Even if you've got a grappling hook, I mean, how big is your grappling hook? Like fifty stories? Like, what do you? How big is that cable? You know, it's not really feasible. Um, so you just got to like what, run up the stairs or take the elevator. <laughs> so it's like, how do, you, right. how do you get back up to the top of the skyscraper in Gotham City? It's always at like tough as some tall buildings. So. so Iron Man then. He'd be so Iron, Man. Iron Man? Yeah, Iron Man. Well, because you're good problem. at calculating the cost of things and stuff like that. So like, would it be cheaper to become Batman or Iron Man or just pay every criminal that you encounter a salary to just stop being a criminal? I think they're trying I mean, I'd that. I'd like to be um, Irony Man. Irony Man. <laughs> um, I just d defeat villains using the power of irony. Okay. It's like, oh, too much irony, I can't stand it. <laughs> Please, no, stop the irony. I can't handle it anymore. I give up, I give up. Too much irony. That would be, be, be awesome. <laughs> That'd be totally awesome. That would be awesome. Yeah, it would be. Don't make me use irony again. <laughs> <laughs> Cheaper, too. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the metaverse, which like takes technology to the next level and puts us in like a virtual world, like do you see that as being dangerous, hopeful for humanity? Like, what's your view on that? Maybe we're in the metaverse right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just metaverses all the way down. <laughs> um, I don't know if I necessarily buy into this metaverse stuff. Um, although people talk to me a lot about it, it's Web three. You know, like, sure, you, you can put a TV on, on your nose. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that makes you in the metaverse, you know. Um, and it's like weird, like, you know, when I grew up, it was like, don't sit too close to the TV, it's gonna ruin your eyesight. Right. And now I got like, TV is like literally right here. <laughs> I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> is that good for you? <laughs> I mean, have you tried these games, uh, the, yeah. you know? The VR, VR Oculus stuff? Yeah, yeah it, they're okay, you know, mm -hmm. but like it gives you motion sickness if you try to walk around. Like, like you can do a video game on your sort of computer or console or whatever, and 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 you can you can be in a, like a first person game and and uh, and move rapidly and not get set motion sickness. But if you try to do that in a bit with VR goggles, you get motion sickness. It's like weird. So then you have to like teleport around with. Yeah, it's okay. <clears throat> so it doesn't it doesn't feel like like that's the answer necessarily. You can uh, team up and near link the into the brain so that you don't have to have the glasses. There you go. Yeah, a neural link long term, a sophisticated neural link, could um, put you fully, fully in a virtual reality thing. Um, so I guess what I'm getting at is yeah, exactly what could go wrong. Like the the negative implications, the kind of dystopian implications that some are drawing out. Like I think it was I think Jack Dorsey was really critical of the whole metaverse idea. You see problems with people I, I know, living just, in a virtual world and leaving the physical world for for that, and I don't see someone strapping a friggin' t you know screen to their face all day uh, and not wanting to to ever leave. I, it seems no way. Yeah. I mean, if you does, does it feel like that to you? It doesn't seem like that to me. Yeah. It's like it, it gets uncomfortable to have this thing strapped to your head the whole time. It definitely needs to be lighter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if the weight, I mean, if it was like super light, it should still be like I don't know. It's not so like you want to be there all day. So, you know, I think we're far from disappearing into the metaverse. Uh, this sounds 
just kind of buzzwordy and you know I, I don't feel like hey, like like hey is this you know have I just gotten too old and like am I like one of those people who was like dismissing the internet whatever 95 as being like some fad or something that's never going to amount to anything although I didn't I was like saying like 95 was literally the internet is going to be transform humanity and, and it's going to be like you know prior information basically just went by osmosis like unless a person called another person or carried a letter physically to another person like how did you get information around the vast majority of information was literally person to person then you had like the fax machine and stuff but it's just like the, the way the metaverse is being sold right now is so underwhelming. It's like you're going to be in, it's like Zoom meetings, but there's an avatar <laughs> for, for the person next to you, you know? And you maybe, you get to de- maybe you get to yeah. design your avatar. Like I said, I don't, I don't want to be like, you know, some old, some old codger sort of dismissing the internet in 95 is not amounting to anything. So there's some danger with that. That's the case. But uh, I, I currently am unable to see a compelling metaverse situation um, or... Web three sounds like more marketing than reality. I don't get it. You know, and maybe I will. So, uh, but I don't get it yet. Let me put it that way. It's definitely not monkeys playing pong. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. I just like to advertise for White Claw. <laughs> yeah. White Claw. Real men drink White Claw. <laughs> Can we get our guys on the phone with White Claw? <laughs> Sponsor after the fact. <laughs> if you we'll want us to leave that, that in, yeah. then you will pay us. Well, this is, you know, this is a, <sighs> the, first White Claw, the first White Claw ever drunk on the Babylon Bee podcast. So that's great. You hit a point in your life where you, you, know, you made plenty of money and you could do whatever. What drives you to just keep? Yeah, it could be slipping my ties on, right. on a tropical island. Uh, a robot and, uh, servant like, or something. You know, windsurfing with naked models. Yeah. yeah. You know, some people do that. So like, what drives you to, I mean, obviously you, you so work in hard why, work. Wait a second, why, why am I not, what, why? I just realized, yeah. what question the, everything. I've, I've, I've been wrong all this time. <laughs> why am I working 90 hours a week? This is crazy. Because I'm always fascinated by the idea of like, I've made it. People always want to say, be able to say, I've made it. I've arrived. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And like, how do you, you know, you, you hit those little islands in your life and you actually have to break yourself of that mindset. And what are ways that you break yourself of that mindset and keep on going? Uh, I didn't put all this effort into building SpaceX and, and uh, Tesla because I thought they were easy ways to make money. Um, I mean, anyone who starts a car company thinking it's an easy way to make money is a fool. Um, there are only two car companies that have not gone bankrupt in the history of the United States, and that's Ford and Tesla. And Tesla came um, within in- inches of going bankrupt multiple times, as did SpaceX. So... Right, and like who starts a rocket company think it's going to be successful. Um, I, I saw it, about, I mean, I, the, both, both those companies I, I thought had less than a 10% chance of success. And I thought it was overwhelmingly likely that I would lose the money that I made from PayPal. You know, I, I came to North America when I was 17 just by myself. Um, and I had like a, like a, a few thousand dollars in, in traveler's checks back when traveler's checks were a thing, you know, um, in Canadian dollars. Uh, I land, <laughs> I landed in Montreal. Um, I have some family in Canada, uh, and my mom's uncle lived in Montreal. But like we didn't, we didn't know his phone number, so I, I land in Montreal, and my mom says, oh, "I just got a letter back from my uncle, and he's in Minnesota or something." <laughs> so I'm like, oh, "Okay, I don't know what to do now." So I just stayed in a youth hostel and like bought a bus ticket across Canada, and I worked in various like odd jobs and stuff. I worked on my on my mom's cousin's farm wheat farm in Saskatchewan for six weeks. <laughs> That's where I had my 18th birthday, actually. I worked in the lumber mill, uh, chainsawed logs, and did, did various odd jobs. Um, and, uh, and then went to college in, in Canada for a couple of years. I paid my own way through college, by the way. So, but in Canada, it's like easier because the college is more subsidized. Um, and I was a Canadian citizen through my mom. So, and I got some scholarships and loans and stuff. And, and then... Um, I applied to the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, didn't think I'd be able to go because um, tuition is really high, but they, they gave me a scholarship and loans and stuff, so I was able to go there. Um, I graduated with uh, about $100,000 in student debt, and um, I was going to do grad studies at, at Stanford, and decided to put that on hold uh, to try st- starting an internet company. Um, I actually... 
I tried to get a job at Netscape, um, but they didn't. I'd send my resume and didn't get a response. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I guess I, sh I can't get a job at, at the, there are only a few internet companies and I can get a job at any of them. So I was like, I guess I want to do something on the internet, I gotta start my own company. Uh, and, but I ended up writing the first uh, maps and directions on the internet. I wrote it personally, uh, maps, directions, yellow pages, white pages, uh, on a puny computer, like with hardly any, com so it had, you had to be like, the code had to be super tight. Um, I even have some patents on like maps and directions and yellow pages and white pages and stuff uh, from from ages ago. They're they're lapsed now, but th that that company ended up getting bought by by Compaq for about three hundred million dollars. I own seven percent of the company, so I got like twenty million dollars from that. Put most of it into uh, X.com, which merged with Confinity to create PayPal, and then I got about one hundred eighty million dollars from that, and I put all of that into. SpaceX, Tesla, and, and Solar City. Uh, I just basically kept, you know, kept all the chips on the table and just like let's play another round. I mean, most people take the chips off the table, or, or at least some of their chips. And uh, and then SpaceX and Tesla ended up being valuable, and that's where I'm. But but the, the the reason for SpaceX and Tesla is you know Tesla. If you say like what is what is the how would you assess the historical good of Tesla? I'd say it's the degree to which Tesla accelerated sustainable energy. And I, I've been interested in, in electric cars for a long time, um, since maybe high school or certainly early college. My original interest in electric vehicles was not so much due to environmental concerns, but rather from the uh, concern that uh, we'd run out of oil uh, eventually, and uh, or it would become extremely scarce and expensive, and then uh, civilization would collapse because we couldn't drive cars or you know run power plants and stuff. So. So we need some form of sustainable energy generation and consumption, or, or we're, civilization's gonna collapse. So that was my original interest in electric vehicles and solar energy. And, and then I, I do think there's um, some risk of uh, negatively affecting the climate. Uh, you know, as, as you increase the CO2 concentration in the oceans and atmosphere, this, you increase the risk of something uh, going wrong, um, I, I, I am I am not like in the camp of of, of the super alarmist uh, global warming. Uh, I, I you know like I think like I don't think we're like um, screwed because of like the the current parts per million of CO two in the ocean's atmosphere. I, I think like this is actually not not a terrible level. However, um, the there's so much inertia uh, in the direction of mining and burning hydrocarbons that, you know, the, 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 the world is still over, overwhelmingly dependent on mining and burning hydrocarbons. Um, so, you know, if, if this continues and you start really driving up the, the CO2 in the oceans and atmosphere, then there's, there's, there's increased risk uh, of uh, Accelerating climate change, basically warming up the oceans and um, and raising the sea level. So, so I think that's, that's like it's just. I think that's probably just not a wise risk to take, since we will in in any case uh, have to transition to sustainable energy long term because we will eventually run out of oil and coal to mine and burn. Uh, then why run the experiment to see if you know, to see if something bad will happen with a high CO2 concentration in the ocean's atmosphere. Like, it's a pointless experiment. Like, we know we have to get to some uh, sustainable energy economy. It's tautological. Like, so I think there's, we should try to get there sooner so as not to run the risk of climate change. It would not, it, climate change would not be catastrophic to civilization, but it would be very disruptive. Humans love living right on the ocean, so it's like we're almost like a like a thermometer. It's like it's like if, if we we're living right on the beach. Okay, so uh, th this is like so even small changes in the sea level in sea level will put a lot of houses underwater. Even little little changes, not don't have to be big. We just we've just inherently created civilization that is highly sensitive to changes in temperature. A lot of politicians who are alarmist about this stuff buy homes right on the water, though, don't they? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 
I'm, I'm not sort of um, into like vilifying the oil and gas industry because um, I think I think the the reality is like if uh, if we don't have oil and gas right now, civilization would collapse um, and everyone would be starving. So we obviously need oil and gas right now. <laughs> it would be absurd to just stop it. Like it's not not feasible. Um, uh, but but I do think we should be trying to accelerate progress towards a sustainable energy future, uh, not slow it down. You know, I think it's just a sensible thing to do to, to uh, try to move faster to a sustainable energy economy uh, rather than slower, um, because th that reduces the risk of, of the climate experiment. And like I said, since we know we have to get to a sustainable energy economy anyway, why run this experiment? It's, it's just not smart. Anyway, so, so the fundamental good of Tesla, I think, is by, you know, sh should be measured by how, by how many years did Tesla accelerate the transition to a sustainable energy economy? Um, 10 years, 20 years, you know, that's like the fundamental good of the company. But to Ethan's point, he's asking, like, why not, like, is, is, that, is, that, your, is that your answer for why you keep going is because these, are, these things make a difference. They make a difference ultimately for the flourishing of humanity, for the longevity of humanity. Is that why you're not on a beach somewhere sipping Mai Tais or White Claws? <laughs> yeah. I don't actually drink a lot of White Claw. <laughs> uh, this is not about like trying to enrich myself. Um, I do not live a life of cons conspicuous consumption. Um, I work, you know, very long hours. And, but I think, I think what Tesla is doing is important to the future. Um, and that's that's why I keep doing it. Um, and I think you know it's it's something that I think is uh, it Tesla increases the probability that the future will be good for humanity. And and then for SpaceX, um, I think I think uh, it's important that we take the actions like, like that we become a spacefaring civilization and a multi-planet species. This is an exciting, inspiring future. You know, you need to have things that. When you wake up in the morning, you're like you're excited about the future. Why live if, if it's all about solving problems or being miserable? But why live? Um, so there got to be things that are that are inspiring that like you know get you in the heart. And I think space is one of those things. So you know, look at the Apollo program and you know sending sending people to the moon in '69. And wasn't that a great thing for all of humanity? Great thing, and if you ask people, like, what are, some, what are some of the greatest things that humanity has ever done? That would be one of them. And I think, you know, around the world, people would agree with that. You know, if you believe it really happened. <laughs> yes, I do get that question. <laughs> this is, um, yeah, <laughs> we, we we went to the moon not just once, but but several times, and um, I think the Russians would have called us out on that one if it wasn't true. You know. Uh, to say the least. <laughs> among, among, this is like the, yeah, it's, we went to the, we went to the moon. Okay. The Russians didn't like us at the time. Yeah, the, the Russians, yeah. the Soviet Union was not a huge fan of America. They were yeah. congratulated, like, they were looking at us in the tel through telescopes and like, is this real or what, you know? Uh, they would have called Bubble gum. <laughs> if it was, that's for sure. It was a huge, you know, victory, you know, ideological victory for the United States and Western civilization. So, but anyway, the, the the point is like we we want to have an exciting, inspiring future, and and one where we are a spacefaring civilization and a multi planet species. I think it is a much more exciting and inspiring future than one where we are forever confined to Earth and never go back to the moon. And and the moon was our high water mark, and that's all we ever did. That's depressing. Um, and and there's also from a long term basis. If we're a multi-planet species, it's like life insurance for life itself, not just for humans, but for, for all the creatures on Earth, um, because we bring them with us. And, and they can't build spaceships, so you know, we are, we're, in effect, the steward of life. Um, and you know, we, we, can make a, we can make Mars like a, you know, another planet with life on it. Um, you know, it is, you know, uh, it's probably a dangerous analogy to use, but it, it, it's a bit like, Noah's Ark, but you know we'd, we'd bring more than two, two of every creature because it's a little incestuous, frankly. Um, yeah, I mean, just do you know, like, how does this work? You know.
<laughs> the second generation. And, and did he hate the dinosaurs? Like, what's a... <laughs> why, why, why was it like, F you to the dinosaurs? You're going to get answers. What? What? It's like pro-incest, bad on dinosaurs. I don't get it. Anyway. Um, and it would have to be a very big vote. So, but, but there's, you know, this metaphor, perhaps, I don't know. Um, you know so anyway, so the, like there's, there's some, some risk, especially over a long period of time, that something calamitous would happen to Earth, and if we're just on one planet, that would be the end of life itself. And certainly the, 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 sun, the sun is slowly expanding, so uh, you know, the Earth's rough, roughly four and a half billion years old. Some people might disagree with that, but <laughs> it appears to be that way. Um, uh, and um, in, 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 in roughly half a billion years, the sun will expand to make, make Earth probably uninhabitable. In a billion years, definitely uninhabitable. Uh, so basically, if intelligent life had take, taken 10% longer to evolve on Earth, then it we would never evolved at all because it would be destroyed because the oceans would boil and, and, and they would, we wouldn't be able to exist. So I mean, no matter what, the universe will end in heat death, though, right? Eventually. So it's all futile to some extent, if you go far enough. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, if, if heat death is the outcome of the universe, it really all, is all about the journey. Mm. Like, you know, they say it's like, <laughs> you know, the journey is, is, is uh, half, the, half the fun is the journey or whatever. Well, if heat death is the end of the, the universe, the journey is all the fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, Can um, we just evolve heat resistance, become like <laughs> lava beings? It's not, it's, 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 not, it's, it's cool. It cools it's cold. eventually with entropy and it's it's the, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> it's the death of heat. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can we just evolve to that? It's like entropy, <laughs> entropy, no escaping that from me. <laughs> <laughs> entropy, the ultimate enemy. <laughs> He thought the devil was bad. Try entropy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Try getting away from that. But yeah, I mean the yes, I mean technically the being a multi-planet species would increase the probable lifespan of of civilization and and life as we know it. Um, so, I mean, we, humans don't live forever. Uh, so, but just because we don't live forever does not mean that civilization cannot live much longer than than we do. Civilization lives much longer than any individual human. So th this is not about like escaping to Mars. This is simply, I mean, I, I will die probably long before Mars is a self-sustaining civilization. Uh, it's just, I think something we should, we should do in order to have a much longer probable lifespan of civilization. And it's interesting and exciting. And, um, and Mar Mars is, is like, a, it's like an essential next step to like, there, there are these like, you know, uh, filters, they're called the, like the great filters. And, because you have to say like, where are the aliens, you know? It's like the Fermi paradox. Where are the aliens? If the universe is 13.8 billion years old, shouldn't they be everywhere by now? And I'm not aware of any evidence for aliens. People ask me about that too. Uh, where are the aliens? I'm like, man, if anyone would know about evidence of aliens, it would be me. And I, I've seen nothing. So I think it may have been Carl Sagan who said, uh, you know, there's like we're either alone in, in the galaxy or there are a lot of aliens and, and each answer is arguably equally terrifying. Um, it's, like, it's like, hey, we found a <laughs> aliens are on their way. Uh, too bad it's the invasion fleet. Um, <laughs> You know, um, so I, I don't know. It's like, where are, the, where are the aliens? Like, maybe there aren't any in this galaxy. Um, and maybe the, what we have here is a very, very rare situation. Um, you know, a, brief, a, a brief flickering of consciousness in the dark, like a little candle in, in a vast darkness. And we should not let that little candle go out. So my dad's a rocket scientist at, a, at Boeing. And he had a question. Rocket engineer. Yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, I'm well, ask when you. people say rocket scientist, they, they, they really mean rocket engineer. Uh, okay, yeah. So he's a rocket engineer. And uh, he says, at what Mach number does Starship endure max Q, maximum dynamic pressure? How much pressure is that? Does that make any sense to you? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, 
Yeah, max, max Q, maximum dynamic pressure is, is when you're at um, a combination of speed and atmospheric density such that the, uh, the wind force on the rocket is, is the highest. Um, and so a, as you climb higher and higher, the ex atmospheric density decays exponentially. Um, and um, so you hit this point of, of the combination of velocity and, and air density, which is maximum dynamic pressure or maximum Q. Um, and uh, th this, this is mostly a function of uh, thrust to weight. So if you have a, a low thrust to weight rocket, you will um, have uh, typically a, a lower max Q. Um, and if you have a high thrust to weight rocket, you'll have a higher max Q if you do not throttle down. And so, uh, and, and it also kind of depends on, on, on what trajectory you're flying. Are you flying a low with orbit trajectory? Uh, single burn insertion or, or a, a uh, say, a geosynchronous transfer orbit with a low perigee, then you'll have a, high, a higher max Q because you will uh, spend, you'll, you'll spend more time going uh, sort of horizontal instead of vertical. Um, getting to orbit is mostly about your, getting to orbit is, is about your, your velocity parallel to the Earth's surface. So around Mach 23 Mach to Mach 25, uh, you, you're, you know, so roughly 23 ish times the speed of sound is when you reach uh, orbit, orbital velocity, roughly 17,000 miles an hour. So, um, and, and, and that's, that's what it means to go up and stay up. You only need height in order to get out of the, the high density portion of the atmosphere so that you don't slow down. Um, you None of that was correct, I disagree. Uh, yeah. I disagree. Yeah, agree totally, disagree. I give a totally different answer. I don't have time to get into it right <laughs> no, it all now, checks but. out. <laughs> <laughs> it all checks out. Yeah, so, I mean, typically, um, a, a rocket is going to hit max Q uh, somewhere between Mach 1.4 and 1.8, uh, and, um, and and that Q level is going to be maybe 400 to 800 pounds per square foot. Um, uh, now, a Starship is intended to have a high th a highish thrust to weight um, because with a fully reusable rocket, the uh, the cost of propellant starts to become significant, whereas if you have a, an expendable rocket or a partially reusable rocket, the cost of propellant is, is tiny compared to the cost of the rocket. Um, so, so you actually want a higher thrust to weight uh, to minimize cost per ton to orbit with a fully reusable rocket than you would for an expendable. Uh, so, so probably Starship will have at least a 1.3 if not closer to a 1.5 thrust to weight, which would, uh, if, if with, with, without throttling down, which aspirationally we would not throttle down, uh, would, would have a, quite a high Q. Um, maybe as high as uh, 1,000 uh, or even 1,200 pounds per square foot. Um, so that's, uh, and, and, and probably, probably, you know, uh, at, at, at what velocity? I mean, I'd guess uh, Mach 1.4 to 1.5, something like that. Okay. Well, my dad very much enjoyed that answer, I'm sure. I think as a male feminist, though, one thing about <laughs> the rockets is the, the phallic rope. symbology. <laughs> <laughs> what would it take to get some more vaginal shaped rockets? <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, for well, equality? Um, can we make that happen? Aer aerodynamics and hydrodynamics. He's going to give you a serious answer. Share, share similar properties, whether biological or mechanical. Okay. Good answer. <laughs> That's all I got on a rocket science. Uh, robots. Yeah, Tesla bot. So you're creating robots. Have you ever seen a sci-fi movie in your life? Never. Okay. <laughs> I thought maybe not. You know, like, because things can go wrong. Yeah, they could. Happens. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah. Um. The robots are not are not the the scary part. The scary part is uh, uh, AGI or artificial general intelligence, digital superintelligence that far exceeds human intelligence, um, and. Um, you know, if, 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 if there's a digital superintelligence that is just vastly smarter than the smartest human, um, we could lose control of it, and then it, 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 could, it, could, just, it could do something bad, potentially. 
Um, I'm, I'm, these things are just probabilities, they're not certainties. Um, so it's, it's not the like I said, it's not the robots. It's the digital superintelligence to be concerned about. I, I think this is definitely one of the issues that we need to be concerned about uh, as an existential risk. Uh, I think we should have a regulatory agency that oversees uh, advanced AI um, uh, because you know generally, like I, I do think there are important roles for the government, and and one of those roles is in regulation of, of industry to make sure that uh, any, any uh, that the company is not making shortcuts uh, that uh, endanger the public. So, you know, the FAA does, has done, done generally a great, great job of ensuring that aircraft are safe. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's literally safer to fly on an American airline uh, or in any, in any sort of airline overseen by the FAA uh, than it is to live in your house. Just to give people a sense of, well, you're we're more likely to die. Your probable lifespan is less if you live your entire life in your house, or uh, than if you live on a plane. Because uh, in your house, you can get murdered by a spouse, um, get bitten by a louse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if you live in a plane in Afghanistan, that's not maybe this, the case. Well, if, if, if it's not, if if, the, if if it's not overseen by um, a, a uh, regulator that like the FAA, then then it, then it's not necessarily going to meet the same safety standards. What if your spouse is on so, the plane? <laughs> well, I think see, the, the the planes have you know they have means of stuffing like you can't. It's hard to bring a gun on a plane. Yeah. Um, and uh, even a knife or even a bottle of lotion at this point, you know. So your spouse couldn't bring any of those things. On the plane. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they have just. Punch you with yeah. a, or, or stab you with a spork, or something, you know, plastic spork. You know, it's like hard to kill someone with a spork. Um, so, and, and then planes also have like flight attendants are trained in first aid. They've got like uh, they can do CPR. They, they've got defibrillators. Uh, if, if somebody's you know, having medical issues, they'll immediately land the plane, and an ambulance will meet you at the airport. So, uh, and you're not going to like you know, drown in the bathtub or get electrocuted by a toaster or, you know, have, have your house burned down or because of the toaster. By the way, toasters cause a lot of houses to burn down. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the, one of the, the main causes of house burning down are to, like toasters and dryers. There's also a decent <laughs> chance there's a doctor on the plane at any given time, right? That happens all the time. Like a doctor yeah. is like treating somebody on a plane in, in your house, you know? Yeah. So, so planes are very safe. Uh, and, and, um, I mean, generally speaking, the FDA does a good job of overseeing uh, food and, and drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this might, might be a bit of a, a conservative bias on, you know, where uh, at times there's an asymmetry with the FDA where um, something that, that could help a lot of people is not approved because it, it might hurt a small number of people. So th there's a sort of like a, uh, a, bit, of a, a bit of an asymmetry. Uh, like, so regulators, they're, they're, in general, can have a bit of an asymmetry uh, where they are, they're punished a lot for something going wrong, but not rewarded enough for going something going right. Um, so that, that's just a general you know, uh, um, challenge with the, the punishment and reward of, of regulators. They can be a little conservative. So, but, but I think there should be a regulatory agency to oversee um, you know, anything that is a danger to the public. Um, so, and, and I think AGI could be an interest of the public, so therefore should, should have some oversight. Um, and, and normally great regulatory agencies are very reactive. Um, so t like for seatbelts, for example, which lack of seatbelts caused, I don't know, 10 million deaths worldwide. I mean, a, a massive number. And the car industry fought seatbelts for a very long time. And, uh, and eventually after many deaths, um, uh, the uh, Department, of, Department of Transport, uh, NHTSA, which oversees this regulatory body for cars, uh, said all cars have to have seat belts. That you can't just not have a seat belt. Um, but, but that, I don't know, it took 15 years or something, or maybe longer, uh, maybe 20 years before seat belts were mandated. So, uh, and then you know, baby seats are a lot of a lot of kids and babies died because they're just like sitting on this 
you know, on a, a seat with nothing. I mean, I, I kind of grew up sitting on a seat with nothing. Yeah, we'd ride in the bed of the truck. Right? Yeah, <laughs> seriously, I rode, rode in the bed of the pickup truck for it's hours. Survivor today. bias or something. I was fine. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was fine. But if, if, if there was an accident, it was yeah. game over, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so. So you do see some good in government with when it comes to regulation and stuff like that. But yeah, you don't generally yeah, think I, the government can spend your money more effectively than you can. Yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I would say like generally, I'm I'm like. I think pretty moderate. I'm not like an sort of an extreme libertarian. Um, I think there are roles for the government uh, that make sense. Like I don't think we necessarily want like a, a private army uh, or private police force or private. Yeah, I, I think there's you know uh, certain things that that are probably the, the the right role for the government. But but anything done by the government is going to be inefficient um, because the government is a monopoly. Um, it, it, like. People that don't like corporations should not somehow think that the government is, is much is much better because the government is a, a corporation in the limit. It is the ultimate corporation uh, with a monopoly on violence. So, um, so, so like I think uh, you know the right role for the government is is, is like to be uh, act in a regulatory capacity, um, and but but the, we, we should aspire to have. The government be be a a limited actor in the economy. Um, so, you know, you could say like, what percentage of economic output should be uh, government? You know, um, and maybe maybe a third or something like that. You know, once you start getting above fifty percent government, I think that's problematic. So, um, you could look at at countries like East and West Germany, North and South Korea, and there's you know there was just essentially an arbitrary line drawn out to divide the countries. And East Germany was like kind of 100% government. West Germany was, I don't know, probably at least 40% government. They're like, you know, relatively socialist. Um, and yet the GDP per capita of, the, you know, of, of West Germany was, I think, five times higher than East Germany. So that just shows you just how big of a difference it is if, if you have like something that's close to half government versus 100% government. Uh, private sector is probably a factor of 10 more efficient than the government. Um, and, and this, like, this is sort of, this is also true of just, just generally. If you have like a monopolistic private corporation, um, then the forcing function for serving the customer is weak. Um, but at least private corporations can go bankrupt, and the government cannot go bankrupt unless the people go bankrupt. Like basically, unless it exhausts extracting uh, money from the population. So, well, they're trying their best. So. <laughs> yeah, it's just you know. So, so it's just you want to just knowing that the government is uh, is inefficient as any large monopolistic corporation would be, um, and it is the ultimate large monopolistic corporation. We should uh, minimize how much the government does. Um, you know, keep it to what is essential, um, and and not go beyond that. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, the conservative concern with that is you start to give them, you know, you give them a foothold and then they're just going to keep going. Like you give them a regulatory um, capacity over something like AGI and then they're just going to start to, you know, overreach more and more. Because that's what we've seen in the past. You you know, you give them an inch and they take a mile. Yeah, but I, I mean, does anyone realistically want to delete the FAA or the FDA? Probably somebody. We got an anarchist in the corner. Right? <laughs> I mean, it used to be if, it, like you go to the store, like you you, you buy some whatever steak or or, or some something from the store, and, and it's like it's like poisonous, you know, and, and or, or you know the like we take for granted that we, the food we buy is is uh, at the store is is not going to kill us, you know, uh, actually, you know. Uh, because some company cut costs and decided that you know having E. coli and salmonella is okay, you know who cares <laughs> type of thing. Um, so, so I think you know like we like we take for granted that the, that the food we we buy at the stores is is um, is not poisonous, um, and that uh, the, the drugs we buy like that is uh, the very, very extremely unlikely. Like the drugs will be consistent and, and they will do what they say they're going to do. Uh, which, except for by the the sort of vitamin supplements industry, which can basically is, is unregulated, and so they can say things that are not true, and people still still buy it. <laughs> um, anyway, so it's, so it's like I think you know you really want like you can think of like the 
you, you want some kind of referee on the field. So like, you know, for, um, you know, like it's like a, if you're watching say a football game or, or, or something like basketball, there's referees. Okay, so would, would the games be better or worse without a referee? They'd be worse, you know? Um, so the, I think like the role of a referee in, in games is important. Um, and so the, the government's role as a referee, I think is also important. Um, you just don't want to have the government be kind of on the field as a player. It would be weird if the referees just suddenly started playing ball, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, the game would not be as good. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, and other things that make me think you've never seen a sci-fi movie before, you have uh, <coughs> Neuralink. So you can like put things in people's brain or something. Uh, what's that like? <coughs> What's that like? Is, is, what it, is it cool? Do you like it? <laughs> you like it? <laughs> well, I'll try it. You might like it. Okay. No um, problem. You found it. <laughs> yeah, with, with Neuralink, uh, Neuralink is in part, um, well, in fact, the, 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 <coughs> the sort of, the reason I created Neuralink was um, long term as a risk mitigation for uh, digital superintelligence uh, in that if we <coughs> are able to effectively um, achieve symbiosis uh, with digital intelligence, then uh, we're, we're sort of, the collective human will is better able to steer things in a direction that we'd like, uh, or, or even with benign uh, AI, at least go along for the ride. So, because even with a benign, benign superintelligence, uh, if it's so much smarter than us that, you know, uh, that it really can't even communicate effectively, because it's so fast, um, and and then like talking to us is like talking to a tree, you know. Because if you look, if you do a stop motion on like a tree, a tree is communicating with its environment just very slowly. You know, it, it looks for the, it looks right now. It's looking for water. <laughs> the tree the roots are looking for water. The the, the, the branches are looking for sun, um, and and the tree has movement. It's just very slow, um, and so um, and we we are already at this point uh, partially a cyborg. Uh, we're de, de, de facto uh, sort of a cyborg in, in that our phones and computers and applications are a digital extension of ourselves. At this point, like if, if somebody leaves their phone behind, it's like missing limb syndrome. You know, like uh, the, the phone is almost like a part of you. Um, and, uh, but, but, the, but the, the issue with that symbiosis is that the, the data rate is extremely slow. So, like, how fast can you, can you can you communicate with your your phone using uh, two thumbs? You know, ten bits per second. It's it's very low the data rate. And if, if computers can, and which they can, communicate at a, a, you know a billion, a billion bits per second or more, and and we're communicating with them at ten bits per second, then uh, that's just an extremely slow communication link, um, and it inhibits. Um, uh, symbiosis with our sort of tertiary digital layer. Like, so we've got sort of basically like a, a primal layer, which is like our limbic system. Basically, it's our, our instincts and a lot of our emotions. And it's kind of like the reptile brain the situation. And then you've got the cortex, which is like the, the thinking part of the brain, the planning and whatnot. Uh, and um, so it's like the second layer. And then, then our phones and computers are our tertiary layer. But there's a just a, a bandwidth limitation. I would very slow to communicate. So, but with with, a, with a, a neural link, you can increase the the communication bandwidth by many orders of magnitude, maybe by a thousand or more. So you're talking uh, about output from the brain to other devices. Yeah, primarily. Yeah, not input to the brain. Uh, it would be both ways. Uh, our input is much less constrained than our output uh, because of vision. So. You know, I don't know, like rough approximation is like our input because of vision is like maybe a, a million times, uh, roughly. Uh, some people are online are going to argue with this, but it's, it's, it's the input to in, input is many orders of magnitude uh, higher than output because of vision. Um, you know, picture, a picture says a thousand words, and a video says I don't know, a hundred thousand words. I don't know, it'd be like there's just you know there's. Um, this is why like, a meme can communicate so much more than a few words. Now, this is obviously very esoteric, and like, I'm not sure this will resonate you know, the, 
with a lot of people like, oh, we need to increase the, the bandwidth between our cortex and our digital tertiary layer uh, by many orders of magnitude in order to not lose symbiosis with digital intelligence. So this is quite esoteric, but, um, but that's the long-term existential risk mitigation of Neuralink, which we may or may not achieve. I'm not saying we will achieve this, but it, it's at least uh, an attempt to solve that. Then um, along the way, Neuralink uh, can solve a lot of uh, brain issues. Like if you've got, uh, and, you know, so if you've got, if you've got like a, a, a severed spine or something. So like one of the, like the first application we're looking to solve is uh, implanting Neuralink uh, in um, someone who has uh, is a quadriplegic or te tetraplegic. Um, so like they have no, they can't move their arms and legs or maybe not even really uh, move most of their face. They can like maybe blink or something like that, you know, like Stephen Hawking. Or, or they didn't have to have severed spine, but he's, like, like there are various, there are various um, mechanical and other, like m mechanical breakages or, or diseases that break the link between your brain and body. Um, and Neuralink um, can solve that. It can certainly, we're confident Neuralink can, can uh, enable someone who uh, is a tetraplegic um, to operate a phone uh, or a computer faster than someone who has hands, working hands. Um, and uh, we've shown this, for example, with the monkey being able to play video games. So you can play a bunch of games, not just Pong. Um, but Pong is currently its favorite game. <laughs> well, I didn't even know monkeys could play Pong but yeah. in the first place. Yeah, monkeys can play Pong uh, with their hand. No, no they problem. good? Um, yeah, they're, that's they're good. Monkeys have good re reflexes. <laughs> uh, so, um, and then that's how, that's how it starts off. You, the monkey, we train the monkey to play Pong I mean with a joystick. Yeah. And then we, we look at the signals that the monkey's brain is sending. Uh, and then we read those signals and, and then we, uh, tra we transfer the signals directly to the game. Um, and uh, you know, so it's, and, and then then we take the joystick away, and the monkey's just playing basically <laughs> tele telepathic That's mind crazy. pong. Wow, um, that's wild. Yeah. So, um, and we, we, we recently got uh, what we think is a world record in bits per second from uh, from any uh, neural neural device. Like we're start we're starting to approach ten bits per second, which is not <laughs> actually. Well, not, not that big, but it's more than anyone else has achieved in, in a useful way. Ten, ten, like close to 10 useful bits per second is where, where we are. And it will, we'll increase that dramatically over time. Um, so, um, so anyway, so the, we're, we're, we obviously want to make sure the device is extremely safe um, and, and extremely well tested. Um, our standards go far beyond what is required from a regulatory stand, standpoint. And... Uh, but we're hoping to do our first Neuralink into a human uh, next year, uh, and um, and like I said, enable someone who um, you know has has almost no no movement capability to um, operate a phone um, as fast or or we think faster over time than someone who has has working hands. So I think that that would be quite a significant thing. And would help a lot of people, and um, and there are many such applications, um, and I'm increasingly confident that um, w uh, we, we can implant a second Neuralink device, so one one that accesses the, the motor cortex, and the somatosensory cortex, and then a, a, a second one that is uh, past where the injury is. Uh, so if you've got a severed, you know, but basically where where are the neurons still functional, um, and implant a second uh, neural link device uh, and uh, act, ha have the two devices talk to each other and just transfer the signals across the where, where, where it broke. Yeah, because yeah. it's like a broken circuit. Right. You know? So if you've got a broken right. circuit, you, just, you, you basically just do a signal transfer between the two. And you don't necessarily even need to, to know what all those signals are. Um, you just need to transfer the signals. Um, so just like if you have like a, an Ethernet cable, you don't need to know what's on the Ethernet cable for the cable to work, or, or a wireless Ethernet from one wireless to Ethernet 
you know, Wi-Fi box to another wireless Ethernet Wi-Fi box. You don't need, need to know what the contents of the signal are in order to transfer the signal. Um, so I, I'm confident that that such thing is possible. Um, I'm not saying we will do it. Um, I don't want to set unreasonable expectations, but I'm, I would say I'm certain that it is possible um, and we will try to make it happen, which would uh, then enable people to walk again and use their hands and I think long-term probably restore full body functionality to somebody who um, has none. Did you know that we created an Elon Musk subscription tier at one point on the B? Did you ever see that? No. You didn't know that we did that? We were, because you would, you would pay a lot of money or something. Yeah, you had interacted with us a couple of times, and so we were like wooing you as a subscriber, come subscribe. But we created our own tier for you. What was the uh, fee on the tier? I don't remember what it was. I think it was like, it was the highest our payment. It was like $9,999 a month or something. But people were signing up for it. <laughs> people were actually signing up for it, though. Every time I would check, I'd be like, is it him? Is it him? It was random people who picked it thinking it was a joke, and it was actually charging their credit cards. We had to like, <laughs> we had, we had all these angry people who were like, my wife is going to kill me if you don't refund this charge. So we had to take the Elon Musk tier down. So we took it down, I guess, before you could, before you could find it. But it was there. We had it there for you. So. Well, thanks. I yeah. guess that's a compliment, yeah. I, th I think. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Very eloquently put. Well, mm. shall we uh, land the plane here with the 10 questions? <laughs> so we... Uh, well, this is podcast started in Kyle's garage. We ask every guest the same 10 questions at right. the end of the interview. We never anticipated we would be asking Elon Musk these 10 these, questions. These are rapid fire, so you can answer them as quick as you want. Yeah. Or you can go on forever. Yeah. Your call. Yeah. Uh, have, you ever, have you ever met Christian rap artist Carmen? <laughs> um. <laughs> Fam? I, I mean, the only common musician I'm aware of is um, Carmen Miranda. Uh, you know, she, she would like dance with like a, like a fruit ball on her head. Yeah. Fruit head. Uh, yeah. Um, and you never met her? No, she, she, she died okay. a, a, a while ago. All right. <laughs> cool. Look him up. <laughs> Are you more of a Calvinist or an Arminian? Or an Arminian? Yeah. It's mean. like a predestination oh, or free yeah. will. Or, like not or you could Armenia. say determinism no, versus I'm like, like, that's an interesting... Well, um, yeah. <laughs> Dichotomy. Yeah. Like, yeah, are those the only two choices? You're, no, you're the, the, the assumption is that or, he, yeah. or, or, or you're yeah. a Calvinist? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the only people that know what an Armenian uh, is are Calvinists. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, free will or predestination is the. Or, did I say that right? No, determinism, determinism versus free will. Free will. It's kind of the more secular version of that. I, I guess my, my mind would say. Um, Determinism in my heart says free will. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, where I grew up, I was, uh, funnily enough, uh, um, I went to Anglican Sunday school, uh, you know, Church of England, basically. Um, and uh, and the, but, but I was also sent to Hebrew preschool, um, although I'm not, I'm not Jewish, but <laughs> nonetheless, I was singing Hava Nagila one day and, and Jesus is our Lord the next. And, you know, to, it's fine if you're a kid, you know, and, and, and Santa Claus, and like, uh, you know, um, <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, that answers the question. Uh, yeah. So uh, you get to add one book to the Bible. What is it? <laughs> you, guys have never, you guys have never updated these questions to, like, apply more uh, broadly yeah. nope. at any point? Mm -hmm. They're unchangeable. Yeah. yeah. They're like the Ten Commandments at this point. Um, I mean, a little bit lower. <laughs> I remember we could have a chapter past Revelations. <laughs> but, I, like, is there a happy ending here? Uh, like, uh, <laughs> um, the uh, Revelations Part 2, the happy ending? Uh, well, you know, if there's, like, a really good book you think everyone should read, because it would be in the yeah, back of the Bible. Everyone should could... read this book. Yeah. Okay, how many people have actually read the Bible? <laughs> Fewer than probably say they have, but oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> do you have? I, I, I mean, at one point, I, I you know, when I was a kid, I was like, I had this existential crisis, and I was trying to figure out what's the meaning of life, and I was like, oh, it all means nothing. It's all, and, and I, and I, you know, read like a whole bunch of religious books, including the Bible, and I'm like, there's a bunch of things in there they didn't teach you in Sunday school. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, dark. Um, 
yikes. <laughs> um, you know, God sure changes his mind. Uh, <laughs> from the Old Testament to the New Testament, I'm like, whoa. That's pretty vengeful in the Old Testament. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> you get to pick a book to add to the Bible. Yeah. A book, uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay. Uh, yeah, good pick. It's a great book. Yeah, great it's book. Great. Uh, cigars or pipes? Um, you know, I'm not sure I've ever really smoked a pipe. Um, my grandfather did. Um, it lo- kind of looks cool, um, but I have smoked cigars. Um, and I think, like, you know, uh, for a celebratory occasion, like cigars and whiskey, that's a pretty good combo. Uh, you get to hang out with any three people, living or dead. Who are they? It's always hard to think of, like, three... Yeah. People. Ethan, Kyle, Seth. <laughs> You're hanging. You got three right here. It's true. I, 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 you know, it's, Jeff it's, Bezos. I wouldn't would, would uh, say there's uh, necessarily like, uh, I think there's, there's a lot of people that would be interesting to talk to. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, is it living or dead, you said? Yeah. Living or dead. Okay. This, is, this is just, you know, a stream of consciousness, not like a carefully thought out yeah. Uh, yeah. answer, but it would be like, uh, yeah. I don't know, like Shakespeare, Ben Franklin, maybe Newton or Einstein. Okay. It's a good group. Bunch of white men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, drinking white clones. <laughs> Cle- Cleopatra sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> whiskey or beer? Or, I guess, white whiskey, claw. Whiskey, oh, okay. <laughs> You went right for the whiskey, so. Nice, all right. Uh, what would be the first thing you would do as president? Well, the, the presidency in the U.S. is designed to be a weak position, or, or relatively weak position, um, it, it, because, you know, obviously the founders of the, of the, of the country did, did not want to create a monarch. You know, wanted to avoid, like, a king situation. Um, so, the, 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 so the presidency in the U.S. Is, is, is meant to be weak, weaker than, say, in a parliamentary system where the majority, essentially the Speaker of the House, would be the, the prime minister or president. Um, so, you have to say, like, what, what, what can you do as the president? Um, in, the, in the U.S., uh, there's a lot of limitations. Um, and unless you have the support of Congress, you, you obviously cannot change the laws. But I, I would I'd probably aspire to re- reduce the size of government. Um, and, um, you know, and, and take a look at the regulatory situation and just make sure there's there's a good garbage collection of regulations. So if there are outdated, as there, there are many outdated and unnecessary regulations, uh, but, but you know, there's, there's, a, there's a strong forcing function for creating new laws and regulations, but a weak forcing function for getting rid of, 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 uh, of bad laws and regulations. Um, and, 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 and I think this, this is just generally a problem as civilization ages without war, where there are new laws and regulations created every year. Um, and so there's like more and more constraints on what you can do. But there's, there's very little effort put to re- remove laws and regulations. And so this is like hardening of the arteries of civilization. And eventually, it'll be like Gulliver's Travels, where you're just tied down by you know, thousands of little strings. And, and it's not like any one string is the issue, but there's so many strings that you can't get anything done. Um, you know, that's part, 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 a big part of why I moved to Texas. It's just like, there's just fewer strings tying you down. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, I think like the, the, uh, the value of, of, of someone just being a, a, a very competent executive officer is, um, is under, undervalued in, the, in a president. Uh, just like, how good are you at running things and getting things done? Mm-hmm. Um, because if you're the president, you're kind of like the CEO of the country. Um, and, uh, and, and so are you good at doing things? <laughs> are you effective and pr- you, productive? You recently said important. a CEO is a meaningless title. What does that mean? I'm just curious how that like went. <laughs> Well, the CEO is not, not like a, a legal title. Okay. Um, I was just saying that, that uh, there, there are all these titles and corporations that are, that are kind of made up. Um, and you can see what is actually uh, required for uh, a corporation, 
when you fill out the form to create one. And so you need a, a president, a secretary, and a treasurer. Same thing as like if you're forming a chess club or a glee club or something like that. Same, same thing. Um, and, and actually, technically, all, they, all three can be the same person. So those are, that's what's legally required. If you don't have those three things, you cannot function as a, as a corporation. Uh, everything else, like a general counsel, CFO, CEO, these are all made up. Like they, they have no legal, no, no meaningful legal bearing. Sounds um, cool. So uh, you only need those th th president, secretary, and treasurer. Um, so there's all these like CXO titles, which right. uh, you know, just are uh, somewhat like re resume inflators. Um, I was just making the point that like people think CEO is a real title, but it's not. Uh, it's, it's not. It's not a legally meaningful title. You, you need someone who is defined as the as the president. But you, you, that, that's that, that's um, that's it. So, um, but now you have like chief marketing officer, chief information officer, chief everything officer. You know, I, I, I sort of think like Sorry, like we right. should have like a. <laughs> You do really like a, a chief, a chief sorcery officer. You know, like, uh, <laughs> so this, this is our SVP of sorcery. <laughs> you know, great, great, great title. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah All right. Uh, question number eight. The master general. Um, where, oh yeah. Have you ever punched anyone, or have you ever been punched? You got any cool punching stories? <laughs> if you don't have an answer for that, we have a follow up. <laughs> It's even worse. <laughs> I don't know about cool punching stories, but I, um, where I grew up was extremely violent. Um, I, never, I never started a fight, uh, except with, uh, with my brother, actually. Mm. <laughs> One exception. Uh, I, did, I did beat my brother up, which I'm... I was just, I don't know, that's how it goes. We all did. But South Africa, when I was growing up, was just an inherently very violent place. Mm -hmm. I got punched in the face many times. Mm -hmm. I almost got beaten to death once. Mm -hmm. So, uh, many times. And I think if you have not been punched in the face with a fist, you don't know what, you have no idea what it's like. Shocking sensation. Shocking sensation. <laughs> have you been punched, Ethan? Yeah, but just by like high school kids. Yeah. Uh, not really. Still, it's just like your face never touches anything, and then suddenly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> punched in the nose. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Like, you can't even see straight. Um, so, yeah. Um, it's funny that people think words are, that they're so sensitive to words. Mm -hmm. It's like, man, if you've ever been punched in the face, words don't mean nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question number nine. Uh, you get to go to one concert, any band in history. Who do you go see? <laughs> any band in history? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Take your pick. Maybe the Rolling Stones are there, you know. When they're the Rolling Stones, peak Rolling Stones, seems like. And the heyday, yeah. Yeah. Good pick. All right, final question to close All our right. time out here. Yeah, I mean, we're here. We're, you know, the Babylon Bee is a Christian organization, you know, and uh, we're a ministry. Well, well, how come we're doing the show on a Sunday? Why aren't you heathens in church? <laughs> exactly. So we have to make it church right now. This is supposed to be a day of rest. We did Zoom church. To Do, justify. Do you have any idea? Like, God said, <laughs> don't work on Sundays. <laughs> okay. Liz, you're going to, guys are going straight to hell for this one. Get into the whole Jesus <laughs> rest thing. Okay. Straight to hell. <laughs> so this is church. This is church. I, so, okay, so to make this church, we have to do, we have to make sure. Just to, We're wondering if you could do us a quick solid and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. <laughs> On Real the quick. show. <laughs> um, Personal Lord and Savior. You know, it's a quick prayer. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's just say, like, I agree with the principles that Jesus advocated, um, and th that the you know there's some some there's great wisdom in what in, in the te teachings of, of Jesus, uh, and I agree with those teachings. Um, and things like turn the other cheek are are very important because, as opposed to an eye for an eye. Um, an eye for an eye leads everyone blind. So, forgiveness, you know, is important and um, 
treating people as you would wish to be treated. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Very important. So it's like a 60, 70% as, yes? <laughs> as Einstein would say, I believe in the God of Spinoza. Um, so, um, but hey, if, um, you know, if, if, if Jesus is, is uh, saving people, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't stand in his way, you know, like, I'll be sure, I'll be saved, why not? Sweet, we did it. Yeah. I think you just said yes. We got him. <laughs> All right. We got him. Uh, yes. We got him. We want to be saved. Yeah. Sounds good. Do you want to get baptized or anything? Yeah. Yeah. I was baptized. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Anglican. You know. yeah. Oh, yeah, he's done. Yeah. They, they, got, they got him in the water when it's yeah. just a baby. Cool. <laughs> this is like second. Yeah. I, I even had like, you know, one of the, one of the blood and body of Christ, which was kind of weird, you know, if you're a little kid, like you get to give you some weird tasting you know, biscuit and, uh, and wine. Yeah. And I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and I'm like, isn't this kind of Just cut it off weird... when he said yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, is this some like fading weird <laughs> metaphor for cannibalism or something? I, I don't get it. Like, what, uh, uh, the, what the hell? I remember thinking that was just crazy uh, when I was a kid. Um, and I'm like, this to, like, whoa, you know? I mean, even as a metaphor, it's kind of odd, you know? Yeah, it so, is. it is. It's like, and should it be giving alcohol to minors? I was like... <laughs> <laughs> we do grape juice. We're bad. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's unusual to even be thinking about that as a kid. Like, yeah. as a kid, you just go through the motions, and right. then it's later on that you think, wait a minute, yeah, what does this weird. actually represent? <laughs> what am I doing? No, when I was a kid, I was like, like, is this actually blood and body? What? what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I, I don't know careful. if I want to eat somebody. Uh, and then it's like, <laughs> what? This is. I mean, I never did it anyway. I'm like, this seems like okay, man. I don't know if this is just pretty odd, you know. <laughs> I remember thinking that even at age five. So I was like, you know, and I, know I was definitely like, you know, at Sunday school there, like when they were telling me all the stories, and I was like asking questions, and like and they really were upset that I was asking questions. <laughs> and I was like, you know. Jesus like fed the crowd with like five loaves of bread and three fish and I'm like how big was the crowd and and like w where did the fish and bread come from did like from his cloak or something like because <laughs> I was like reading books and, and I was like is this like did they materialize is it come, like, come out, like I don't know I, where did it come from you know like how did it would you like take a bite of the bread and would just the the bread would just come back to being a full bread. Yeah, you look away and it's kind the of mechanics pops back of it out. Were, yeah. They left out the details. Well, where did the universe come from? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm not saying I know all the answers here. I'm just, uh, hmm. you know, it's just uh, the uh, and, and like Jesus was obviously very pro alcohol, you know, because one of his miracles was turning water into wine. Hmm. Yeah. And then it was like they were having a party. They ran out of wine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And they're like, let's keep this bender going. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Who, 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 can, who can solve this problem? We're out of white cloths. The friggin' store's closed. And Jesus is like, I got gotcha. you. Okay. Water, now wine. And they're like, party on. You know? So, you know. Accurate. Pro partying with alcohol is literally it was one of the miracles. Bible story time. Like, you're Musk. You're yeah. the, you are the, it's like you're definitely, you're the, Savior, you just <laughs> you kept the party going with lots of <laughs> wine. That's great. Um, so, um, yeah. Well, thank you. I right. appreciate yeah, you coming here and talking with us so very much. Hey, you're welcome. Awesome. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you in person, and uh, you know we'll uh, we'll continue to throw out the sat the satire that we hope you'll respond yeah. to, and That's you know. Keep that going a little bit. Oh, we didn't ask Onion or the Bee, but I guess that was kind of answered earlier. Yeah, he mentioned wasn't it earlier. Yeah, yes, yeah, so we already covered that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I think the Onion has done some extremely funny stuff over time. Um, it's just, it just seems to have been, you know, in, in recent years, somewhat infected by the woke mind virus. So that that just makes everything less funny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's true. Woke mind virus is a world without humor. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping Neuralink can solve that <laughs> woke mind virus. <laughs> Get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. This was right. awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks so much. All right.